Moshe Rabbeinu, we discover in this week's parasha, became relatively wealthy from the offcuts of the stone that he used to fashion the second Luchos. And that's only after Hashem gave him permission that he could take those pieces. The question is, why did he require Hashem's permission? Was there not already an halachic basis to say that as the craftsman, he could have the pieces that fell off? If you look at what it says about how the Ebeshter addressed Moshe Rabbein with the second Luchos, where he says, Psol Lucha, carve for you, Shnei Luchos Avonim Koreshonim, two stone tablets like the first ones. So Yalfin and Gemara, from that the Gemara learns, this is the Gemara, a very interesting Gemara that tells us, Psulos and Shalucha Yehe, that the carvings, the shavings that would fall off the rock, that would belong to Moshe Rabbein. Now, if you look at the end of Bavakama, and this Sikha is actually a Sium on Bavakama, so the final mission of Bavakama tells us, talks about various scenarios of workers, artisans, craftsmen who do work for the owner of a particular object or, or piece of land. So we talk about scenarios where during the course of the work, there's some kind of shavings or pieces or sawdust or whatever the case may be. So the Gemara, the Mishnah asks, Hapsolus and me, who gets those, that, that, what we call, oifol, loy, oil balabais. Does it belong to the craftsman or to the owner of the particular element? So the example we use is moichin, shakovis moitzi. If there are threads that a person doing laundry gets out of a garment, he gets to keep them. Whereas vashah surik moitzi, if it's somebody who's preparing material in a more professional way, then there's probably more material that actually comes off in the preparation stages, and therefore they still belong to the owner of that material. And the logic is that if a person is washing a garment and little threads come off, it will always be a very small amount, and therefore the owner of that material is not going to care that somebody else gets those threads. So it belongs to the craftsman. But the person who's combing through the material in order to make it nice and soft for production, he might get lots of pieces of material that come out, and therefore it belongs to the balabais. Because it's considered a significant, valuable piece of material that the balabais would not relinquish his rights to. Okay, so that's the first example. Then the Tan of the Mishnah gives other examples. When you have a, a carpenter who's using a planer, which is a very specific instrument that takes off thin layers of wood in order to smooth the wood, so it's going to get very thin pieces that come off, he gets to keep them. But if he uses a thicker blade, like an axe, which is... Essentially, because it's an axe head, so it's going to take off bigger pieces of wood, then it's Shobalabais, they belong to the Balabais, same principle, something valuable, he'll keep it. Umesayim, and then the Mishnah concludes, if the person is working on the property of the Balabais, or in the proximity of the Balabais, then after and even sawdust, I feel a dark dark. The tiniest little pieces, essentially of sawdust which come off from the wood, they belong to the Balabais because he's in his proximity. So that's the Mishnah, commenting on the Mishnah, the, the Gemara then quotes a Brisa which says, people who carve stone, there's no concept of stealing, there's no issue of theft. So with wood, there's the possibility. With material, wool, there is the possibility. When it comes to carving stone, no issue about the little splinterings of stone. They cannot be considered theft. That's the b'risa. The Rebbe Maharash has a note on that b'risa where he asks a question. <coughs> so there's a handwritten note from the Rebbe Maharash in which he asks a question on this b'risa. It's a short note that is <coughs> recorded on the end of Bavakama. It's printed in the back of the Tolda, Sefer Toldas of the Maharash. This is his question. We have to understand. If this is true, that a person who carves stone is naturally allowed to have whatever pieces come off the stone, why then did they have to specifically tell Moshe that you get the pieces that come off the stone? There is no issue. 
you can't be considered stealing pieces of stone. Or Pirish Pipleshem Hefker, because they are considered absolutely Hefker. Veinam Shayochim Labolim. They don't belong to the owner. Vahoman Kor of Yoselazen, who's closest to where these pieces of stone are? The craftsman. So he's the first person who's going to have both the physical opportunity and the right to be able to take these pieces. So why does they have to give Moshe permission to be able to get those pieces of stone? Halachically, he's allowed them. That's the question that Reb Marash asks. And then he answers, says, this is not ordinary stone. There was this beautiful sapphire stone. Come on, Maravonim Stam, whereas the Gemara and the Mishnah were speaking about, with well, the Mishnah and the Brisa, Speaking about regular stones, but there was a precious stone, and a precious stone doesn't just become hefker <coughs> that easily. Okay, that's what the Rebbe Marash says. Now, but if you analyze it, the explanation that the Rebbe Marash gives, the fact that when it came to carving the luchos, the Ebrish had to give a special mandate to Moshe Rabbeinu to be allowed to take those shavings is because it was precious stone. That is totally the Vesa Deus Sheva Medrash is not so straightforward. It's going to depend on two different opinions in the Medrash Tanchuma on our parasha. The two opinions are Rav Levi and Rabbi Yochanan. So what do they say? They say, from where did Moshe actually carve out the stones that were going to be used for the Luchos? One opinion is, it was a completely spiritual experience, and he carved them out of the so-called from beneath the divine throne, whatever that means. The other one says, it was stone that he found inside his tent. That they created this outcrop of stone. And that's from where Moshe Rabbeinu carved out the tablets. And from that he could take the shavings. And that's how he became really wealthy because it was all from precious stone. So now, if we go with the first opinion, we don't know which opinion is whose. So we go with the first opinion. Where were the luchas produced? In Shamayim. Whereas according to the second opinion, where were the luchas produced? Here on earth. Which, by the way, the second opinion seems to fit the, the, the language of the psukim much more easily. Because if you read the simple language of the psukim in our parasha, what does it say? Firstly, first the Ebrister says, carve out the stones. And then the Ebrister says, and then come up to the mountain. That implies that where you're doing the stones, down on the ground. That's not only how the instruction was given, it's how the instruction was fulfilled as well, as we see. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I made an oren, and I carved out the two stones. Then, then I took those two luchos and went up the mountain. That's in our parasha, but it's also the way the story is told in Parashas Kisisa. So actually the simplest way to explain would be that Moshe Rabbeinu carved the stones on earth. Now, why is this relevant? Because if we go with the less pshat-like explanation, that where did Moshe fashion the stones? Somewhere in the heavenly realms. So then, then I don't have to say the reason why Moshe had to get permission from Hashem to take the pieces is because it was precious stone. Because we already have another reason why you'd have to get permission. We already saw early in the Mishnah that the halacha is that if the craftsman is working in the presence of the balabais, then whatever he carves, whatever shavings, whatever pieces come off, all belong to the balabais. So he'd need, Moshe would need permission from Hashem in order to take the shavings. So if we go with the opinion that the carving of the lucha is happening in Shemayim, then it's obvious why the Ebishter had to say psal lucha, because really he has no rights to any of those pieces. And that would apply, even if we were talking about regular stone, and not some precious sapphire stone, Moshe would have required the Ebishter's green light, his permission, to be able to take the pieces, in order that he should be allowed those shavings. Because without that permission, if you're in the Balabais' presence, as he was, then whatever you do belongs to the Balabais. Because according to that opinion, that's where he was fashioning the stones, in Hashem's presence.
So in other words, the Rebbe Maharasha's entire explanation only really fits with the opinion in the Medrash that says, where did Moshe carve the stones? Under his tent. Okay, there's still more to the story. As part of the note that the Rebbe Maharasha writes, he quotes also the Muvo, Shashola Rashbats, the famous Rashbats, who subsequently was the teacher of the, of the Friedrich Rebbe, had a question. If you're dealing in Hashem's realm, who cares if it's a precious stone? The whole reason that Rabbi Marash said that he needs permission is because it's a precious stone, and a precious stone, the Balabais would care about it. So you have to have permission before you can take the shards. But for David, does he care about a precious stone? To which, the, the, the Rabbi Marash replied, Where did Moshe fashion the stone, as we've seen from the Medrash? Down on earth. The boys in Shamaya Loy Hoya Psalis. Whatever happens in the heavenly realms, there are no shards, there are no leftovers. And by the way, in answering that question, it naturally displaces the other question about <coughs> well, Moshe is in Hashem's presence. So obviously he needs permission. Well, clearly the Rebbe Marash is taking the view that where did the carving of the Luchos take place? Here on earth. Therefore, the principle of being in Hashem's space is irrelevant to the conversation. So therefore, the question is, why does he need special permission in order to be able to have the shards? To which the answer is, because it is precious stone. Ah, if that's the case of our dying kosher. Well, then we still have a big question, the most logical, philosophical question we should have on this whole concept of being in Hashem's presence. Even if you're down here on earth, and Moshe is carving the stones inside his tent, wherever that might be, in Nebuchadnezzar's terms, there's no space where you're not in his presence. His, his glory fills the entire world. In fact, it's actually brought as an halachic principle in the Gemara, called wherever you are, but because of the you say you're in the Eibushter's environment. Because the pasuk in Tehillim Chavdala tells us that everything in the Eibush, in the world belongs to Hashem, and the Eibushter fills it. So now let's go back to the question: If we're down here on Earth, and Moshe is making, he's carving out the luchos down here on Earth. He's still in Nebuchadnezzar's presence. Therefore, Therefore, he needs Nebuchadnezzar's permission to have any of the shards, regardless of what the material is made out of. Because the halacha is, if you're in the presence of the Balabais, everything belongs to the Balabais. Why then did the Rebbe Marash have to answer that it's because it's precious stone? Surely the precious stone is irrelevant. Now, you could say, ah, but there's another factor to consider when you're talking about the Ebeshte, which is, if the Ebeshte is the owner of the material, then you can't start using the expression that the Ebeshte cares about the shards, even about little pieces that the Ebeshte cares about that. Because surely, logically, Surely nothing is valuable in Hashem's eyes that he should care about it. So the entire rationale for why we would always say that we have to consider maybe pieces or maybe threads or maybe sawdust or whatever it is should belong to the owner should be a non-starter conversation with Abishta because an owner might care about these things. Why would Abishta care about such finite, tiny, immaterial things? Like all chiluk ben avon teves, lavonim stam, it actually shouldn't make a difference to the Ebeshte if it's regular stone or precious stone. Or chasalis or rashbats, which is along the lines of the question the rashbats asked. So if that's what you're going to ask, hang on a second. Ariyash nechiluk kishe hason lemato. Then there's a big difference. If I go with a view in the Medrash that Moshe Rabbeinu fashioned the stones in Shemaim, because then in the world of Shemaim, physical things are of no consequence whatsoever. But if Moshe fashioned the tablets down in the physical world, in the physical world, in the physical world, the Abishra would want us to follow the rules of how Torah defines the physical world. 
That's why, for example, the Rambam will tell us in Hilchus Yisurim is Beach that anything that you dedicate to Hashem, has to be the most beautiful. Why does they care? They, does they wish to care if I do something beautiful? Yes, in the physical world, these are the laws of engagement. That physical things actually have value and they have to be considered. Therefore, the Torah tells us the best, the fattest is what you give to the Ebishta. So if I'm in the environment of physical planet Earth, where I'm bound by the realities of Earth that require that things have value, then I could argue that any item, even regular stone, seeing as it is the work is being done in the Abish's presence, and the Abish being, of course, Akkadish Baruch. And we have the possibility of considering value, if it's valuable enough that the Abish should care about it, because those are the rules of our physical world. Then anything that is produced in Hashem's presence, which is anything at all, belongs to the Abish. Which would fit with the halachic uh, um, suggestion or, or ruling in the Mishnah that in the environment of the Balabais, everything he cares about and therefore belongs to him. The Adrab, in fact, you could actually argue even more strongly. Like the Gemara Shabbos tells us, that every single thing that the Epishtha created, not one of those things is without value and meaning. So then, the question should be the exact opposite to what we thought. We thought the question is, does the Epishtha care? The question should be, every single thing in the physical environment has value to the Epishtha, has a purpose to the Epishtha, nothing is meaningless, nothing is immaterial, therefore everything he would so-called care about. Therefore, whatever we produce in this world should always belong to the Abish, and we should have no rights to take anything for ourselves. Certainly not if it's something which we're doing on Hashem's behalf. So Moshe would have no rights to take any of the shards for himself until Hashem says, Psol Lecha. Now, Lecha Perhaps we could explain that when the Mishnah tells us, remember the Mishnah said that if the craftsman is working in the presence of the Balabais or on his property, and even the most insignificant things like sawdust would belong to the Balabais, maybe, maybe that entire conversation was never applied to people carving stone. Because if you pay attention to the wording in the Mishnah, it actually doesn't seem to be speaking about the stonemason. Vahoraya, let's prove it. Habraisa, remember we said there's a Mishnah, and then there's a Braisa that the Gemara quotes in context of the Mishnah. And it's only in that Braisa we spoke about stonemasons. So what does it say? There the Braisa says, Masata Avonim, Ein Bohem Mishum Gezel. The whole concept of a person who is carving stone does not enter the conversation of being able to steal. And where does the Gemara quote that Brisa? The Gemara did not quote that Brisa in its commentary on the debate. These things belong to the owner, those things belong to the craftsman. And I'll see you my Mishnah. The Gemara quoted that Brisa in the context of the conclusion of the Mishnah, which was the broad statement, that anything produced in the presence of the Balabais automatically belongs to the Balabais, says the Gemara. And when it's a stonemason, there's no such thing as theft. That seems to imply, that the halacha described in this Brisa quoted by the Gemara, that a stonemason can never be considered a thief for taking shards. That halacha is not only if the craftsman is working in his work, workshop, in his property, it would equally apply if he's working on the property of the Balabais. Which, by the way, would fit in line with the other quotations the Brisa uses. The people who prune trees or, or vineyards. 
Shebepashtus is nice. This Melacha said it becomes Shushu Shal Balabais, Eitz of Balabais. Now there, there are things that a person is allowed to take or not allowed to take. But there's no question about it. We're talking about the property of the Balabais. You don't bring the vineyard into your workshop to work on it. You're in the Balabas's field, and yet there is this conversation about what belongs to who. That implies that if the stonemason is in the same sentence, in the same conversation. It's possible that we're talking about him doing the carving on the Balabas's property, and yet, there's no possibility of him stealing. Now, once we make that distinction, maybe that will help us to understand clearly what the Rebbe Marash needed to clarify. Why did we need Hashem to tell Moshe specifically, you get the shards? The only reason he needed the heter was because of the value of the product. It was precious stone. Why? Because if it was regular stone, it would appear from what we've just explained in the Brisa, regular stone, even if the man was working on the property of the Balabais, there'd be no possibility of theft. He wouldn't need a heter in order to take the stuff for himself. So it would appear. There's only one major flaw in this argument. The logical thought process. Why logically you would think there's a difference between working in your workshop or working on the boss's property. The logic should apply. Would reply equally to the person who's carving a stone. What's the difference? What the product is? The logic is, it's in my space, belongs to me. What logic should there be to illustrate that a person carving stone should, for whatever reason, have a different halacha to a person pruning a tree or carving or, or, or planing wood? Especially when you consider that nobody in the real halachic context of paskening halacha goes into the Shemesata Avonim and Menum Dinze, Shemoya Isaiah Sabai, Safan Sir Shabalabais. No halachic poisek considers the possibility that if a stonemason is working on the property of the owner, that he. Uh, <coughs> That we would not allow the, the owner to have the pieces that fall off. Plus, there's another nuance over here. If you go back and read the original note that the Rebbe Maharash made, Gambe Roshim and Loimari specifically says that the woman, the craftsman, is closer to the coalface, he's closer to the working environment than the Balabais. Now, what did he mean by that? Apparently what he meant was, that he meant that the fact that a stonemason is not a thief for taking the pieces that fall off, that's because he's closely implying he's not where the Balabais is. Because if theoretically the stonemason was carving the stone, in the backyard of the Balabais, why would the Rebbe Barash say he is closer to the stone than the Balabais? He's not really. He's in the Balabais' property. In a sense, the Balabais is actually closer than he is. So we still need to really understand why is it that the Rebbe Maharash says the only reason Moshe Rabbeinu needed a heter to take the shards of stone is specifically because of their value. So in order to understand this, we've got to see that there's a distinction between how this whole discussion presents itself in the Brice of the Gemara quoted and a Tosefta that also speaks almost about the exact same things. We've already noted that in the Brice there are two sections that speak about two different kinds of aloha. One section is that if a person is carving stone, any of the pieces that break off from the stone or the shards that come off from the stone, if the person, the craftsman, takes it, it's not theft. Then the Brisa says, people who prune either trees or vines, people who uh, trim hedges, people who weed out the weeds from where there's planting. So people who hoe out around the vegetables. 
Bisman Shabalabais Machpid Aleyen. If the Balabais cares about the stuff that's being removed or pruned or trimmed, then Yeshbe Mishum Gezel. Then the craftsman, or the in this case the worker, if he takes them, he's a thief. Ain Balabais Machpid Aleyen. But if the owner couldn't care less about any of the that uh, those trimmings, Harele Shaloi, then the worker is entitled to keep them. So the, bala, the, the Bryser distinguished between the stonemason, which is one section, and all these other agricultural workers, which is a different section. Whereas the Tesefta puts it all into one conversation. In one paragraph, with all the same halacha. All the different scenarios. If the Balabais cares about the pieces that come off, then the craftsman can't take it, and he's a thief if he does. And if the Balabais doesn't care, then the craftsman or the worker is allowed to take the trimmings, and there's no issue. In other words, Vahainu, there's a big difference over here between the perspective of the Bryce and the Tesefta. If the attitude of the Balabais makes an alachic difference to the stonemason. According to the Brysa, makes no difference. It's not even part of the discussion. Automatically, whatever the stonemason cuts and is not part of the actual work that he's doing, he can keep. According to the Sefta, it depends on the attitude of the Balabais. We need to understand why they have these two different views. Or it's interesting to note Shibitur, which is already now the world of Halocha, even though the Tur gives examples that only the Brysa quotes. Nevertheless, the Tur Paskins that when it comes to a stonemason being allowed to or not allowed to keep the shards. It's dependent on the attitude of the Balabais, whether he cares about those shards or not, which is like the Tosefta says. So what's the different perspectives of the Bryce and the Tosefta, whether or not the stonemason has to know the headspace of the Balabais before he can take the pieces that break off? Rabbi ur the explanation is as follows. The Friha Bryce, yesh chilek be mesatate avonim li doinim. The Bryce sees a clear distinction between the stonemason and his pieces of stone versus the other agricultural people. Why? The Bryce's position is that the trimmings from a tree or from a vineyard or the things you pull out when you're weeding have more value to the Balabayas than the shards that come off a stone. So we have to then know, does the Balabais care about these potentially valuable trimmings? So if the Balabais cares about it, then uh, the guy can't take it for himself. Or let's say that we're talking about an environment where everybody in the environment doesn't care about their trimmings. Where the accepted attitude of the majority population is not to care about those trimmings. Then, even if this particular Balabai says, Yeah, but I care, we say, sorry. You know, majority rules. Because most people in this environment don't care about the, 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 the trimmings. So therefore, you can't now suddenly make a claim on those, on those trimmings. So the Bryce's position is that we expect trimmings to be something a Balabais would want, and we expect that the shards of stone to be something a Balabais would not want. Now, this concept that if there is something which potentially the Balabais could care about. And now we've got to work out this individual, does he care about it or not? So there too, there are two ways to look at why we would allow the worker to take those trimmings if the Balabais doesn't care. Is it one possible legal argument is to say, okay, if the Balabais says, I don't care about those trimmings, then technically he has declared them hefker, ownerless. But as far as Zoe, and if you do follow that logic, 
then then anybody could take the trimmings. But not only the worker or particular individual. Now we're seeing over here that the worker is the one who gets rights to those trimmings. So that doesn't sound like Hefker. So let's look at the alternative. Or is it some low-grade gift? Because it's such an immaterial amount of trimming. Maybe because of that, the Balabais is going to be quite generous and say, you know what? Have it. Even if I don't know that you're taking it. Usually a, a gift is something you consciously give. But over here he'd say, Help yourself. That's in the case of the workers around trees, bushes, etc. But when it comes to the stonemason, the, the way the Brysa expresses it is, there is no legal parameter of theft. In other words, it's not about the Balabais and whether he makes it hefker or he is benevolent and says, help yourself. There is no theft. Because the value of these shards of stone is far inferior to the value of trimmings that come off the vine or the bush or the vegetables. And so now you don't need the balabais to give you the green. Hey, it's okay, you could take it. You only have to say it's okay if it has a value. Considering that these pieces of stone have no value in the eyes of people, ordinary people, they are automatically ownerless and automatically something that the Balabais cannot claim. And so even if this particular Balabais is one of those sticklers and he actually wants every piece, Butler Daito. We don't consider his view. It's overrun by the view of the majority. Not only in the context of how everybody thinks, but beyond that, it's deeper than that. These are items that have no value. You can't claim ownership to something that has no value. Look at how the Rebbe Marash describes it in his note. They are Hefker ve'enom shayochim lehabaylem. And they have no relationship with the so-called owner. It's in the same way as a person can't claim ownership over dust. Just to say it in slightly different words. When we're dealing with the agricultural workers who are trimming the bushes or uh, weeding out the, the, the plants, where we've said that it is completely contingent on the attitude of the Balabais, or completely dependent on what the local custom is, the entire reality of whether there is ownership or relinquishing ownership, or giving a gift, is completely about the owner, the gavra, the individual. How does the individual feel about the scenario? But if I look at the chefts, the object, the object actually has value. The question is, do I care about that value? So, but when we talk about the stone, which we say is not considered gezel at all. All the examples right at the end of the Gemara about these very interesting, uh, these very unique kinds of plants. And then we're saying the object has no value. And that will help us understand the difference between the perspective of the Brysa and the perspective of the Tesefta. That when it comes to the stonemason, is it like the Brysa says, we don't consider the attitude of the Balabais at all? Or is it like the Tesefta says, it depends if the Balabais cares or not? Over Hectum, let's explain the difference between them by understanding what's the difference between a Braiser and a Tosefta in the broadest sense of understanding these two parts of the Talmudic literature. 
החילוק הכללי בין הברייסה לתוספתא הוא, the big difference between a brisa and a tesefta is כמובן במפורש הכלל להשס, as explained by those who teach us the fundamental workings of shas, שתוספתא היא שניתוספה למשנה. A tesefta is something that was added to the mishnah. That's why it's not introduced with the language which that says Brisa language. Tanya or Tana Rabbana. Shah Toiseftas same Shasidir Rabbichia Bifnei Rebi. Toiseftas are sections of teachings that Rabbichia collated while he was in Rebi's presence. Vahoya Oimelo in Rebi would tell him, Kasoiv Kach Vekach. Write these, record those, don't record those. And that's why we say the very famous line, Rebbe lo yishino, Rebbe chia minayin lo. If there's something that Rebbe did not teach, where would Rebbe chia have that teaching from? So Teseftas are a continuum from the Mishnah, so to speak, under the supervision of the organizer of the Mishnah, is Rebbe. Whereas, the Brises are collections of conversations and Mishnahic information that was all outside of Rebbe's base medrash. And so we see, in fact, that Rabbi Chia and others collated the information called the Brises, and they were called Brises. The word Brises comes to the word, the Aramaic word to mean outside. Because they were things that were discussed outside of Rebbe's base medrash. So that teaches us something fundamental. Whatever is within the Tosefta must have been taught in Rebbe's presence and therefore Nemra Be'eretz Yisrael was taught in Eretz Yisrael. Which is where Rebbe had his yeshiva. Whereas Brises which were taught outside of Rebbe's yeshiva they may have been taught in Bovel as well especially when you consider that Rebbe Chia came from Bovel. In fact it makes logical sense that Brises should be more linked to Bovel. Like the Rambam describes in his Akdoma to Mishnah Torah at the time of Rebbe Jews were already Moving all over the place. And Bovel was becoming established as the major Torah center. Now, why is that relevant to us? Why do we have to know where the Tosefters were written, where the Brises were written? There's a very practical application to how they view whether stones are valuable or not. Remember, by Migdal Bovel, the Pasuk says, Let's make bricks. In order to build this tower. Because of Rashi, Rashi explains why they had to do that. Bovel doesn't have a lot of stone because it's a it's a fertile valley, it's a it's a river plain. Same Bovel, they didn't typically use rock because rock is not so easily accessible in Bovel. They didn't really have a value associated with with the shards from stone, if occasionally people would import stone to build in Bavel, there wouldn't be value to the offcuts. That's why the Bryce is very happy to say that the carver of stone is not a thief if he takes the shards of the stone. Because fundamentally, those shards of stone have no value in Bavel. And if one person decides to make a fuss about them, we say, well, you're overridden by the majority. But when you're talking about the Tesefta, so what's the reality of Israel? It's a place with plenty of rock and stone which are used. And they're used for, for construction. In fact, the stone of Israel is actually considered to be high grade. Eretz Yisrael is praised for being a place with powerful, strong stone. So therefore, therefore, the shards, the offcuts of stone, have value. Like the offcuts of a vine would have value. 
And therefore, whether or not they should be permitted to the craftsman will depend on the attitude of the owner because they fundamentally have value. Now you can understand the Rebbe Marash's point about why did Moshe have to have permission to be able to take the shards of stone only because it's valuable stone. Outside of that, stones in the desert were like stones in Bovel. They don't have value. The Jews at that time were nomadic in the desert. A place where it's completely uncommon even though there are these rare occasions where we refer to scenarios that had to do with stones, like, for example, the guy who was collecting wood on Shabbos. So it's it's completely uncommon to use stone when you're traveling around the desert, or and certainly not for construction, because they had no reason to build permanent structures. Because they were constantly moving. Therefore, in context, fundamentally, there's no value to shards of stone as long as you're in the desert. Therefore, as the Reb Marash says, the shards of stone are hefker. They have no link to their owners. Not because the owner doesn't care, because they fundamentally, in and of themselves, have no market value. And it's not just a matter of the attitude of the person says, ah, it's okay, it's, it's immaterial. That's why the Rebbe Marash asked the question, why does Moshe need permission to take the offcuts? It's fundamentally of no value living in the desert. In the desert. To which the Reb Marash answers, That's not ordinary stone. This is precious stone. You cannot use the argument that sapphire, sampirin, whatever sampirin is, has no fa- uh, in- intrinsic value. Which is the argument you'd use for a normal stonemason. Because the offcuts of valuable, precious stones are valuable. Keep moving. Self-understood. That's why they should give him special permission that he should be allowed to take these pieces for himself. And by the way, what was the Reb Marash alluding to when he said in the Rishima, that the craftsman is closer to the material? He's not saying that the crafts on Moshe is closer to the material than the Balabais Hashem. Because the whole conversation about being close to Hashem, as we've already discussed earlier, close to the Balabais, who is Hashem, is not part of this conversation. The Rebbe Marash is making a simple comment that Moshe is closer to the stone than any other of the Jewish people because technically the stone would be considered hefker were it not so precious. So therefore, by virtue of the fact that the craftsman is close to the stone, he would naturally acquire the stone. Naturally. In this particular case, it's a valuable stone, so therefore he needs psalucha. But were it a regular stone, whoever's closest gets it first. Now there's one more layer to the story, which is quite interesting. If you think about the specific context, this is not an ordinary case of a craftsman doing a job for an individual. One more layer. The reason that Moshe needed special permission from Hashem to be able to take the offcuts is not simply because the stone belongs to Hashem. It's because what he was producing had to go into the Oren. And what's significant about that is if it was going into the Oren, then it had to be communal property. Everything that was part of the Mishkan had to be communal property. Either because it was, so to speak, handed over to the community after it was designed. That it has to be very clearly given to the community to own and then become part of the Mishkan. 
ואם מלכתחילה גם קודם הוא עשייה, או אם זה היה דזיגנטי, הוא היה מהסיעה, 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 הוא You actually see this alluded to with something else the Gemara tells us about this particular thing. That that ultimately the Torah was actually given to Moshe. Write the Luchos for you. Carve the Luchos for you. From which the Gemara learns that just like the carvings are yours, the words, the content are also yours. Meaning, Meaning, The Gemara actually explains over that, that the whole pilpul, the depth of understanding, the richness of Torah, was all given to Moshe. It wasn't presented to the community. The community got us there, Sadi Brois. And likewise, the carvings were given to Moshe, like the information was given to Moshe. So now you would say, say one second, the Luchos are communal property. So you might think that the shavings, the offcuts of the luchos, are also communal property. And if, that, <coughs> if that is the case, take these shavings, split them up between the 600,000 Jews, nobody is going to have the value of a pruta. And the concept of theft can only apply to something that has at least the value of a pruta. Because the Torah will only make a person liable for something that is considered of financial value. Anything less than a pruta's value is not considered of financial value. So maybe Moshe could wiggle out of it and say, I don't have to worry about this because nobody could lay claim to it because the value to them is too small. It goes without saying that you cannot steal communal property. Based on the argument that no individual within the community has rights to a pruta. And you certainly could not say if something belongs to the community, there is no concept of theft. Because because the halacha is whether you're liable or not is a different question. Are you allowed to steal? No. The amount of what you steal? Irrelevant. You're never allowed to steal. So therefore, we're talking about communal property. He has to get special permission from the Ebesheh, that it's yours. In the same way as the content of Torah is given as a gift to you, which you will subsequently share with everybody else, the offcuts of the stone are given to you, Moshe Rabbeinu. And in this case, you don't have to share it. You can keep it for yourself. The deeper spiritual meaning, that you find this strange paradoxical ownership or entitlement to the second Luchos. That the actual Luchos belong to everybody because in order to be part of the Mishkan they have to be communal property. Whereas of whereas Moshe is the sole person who has rights to the Ofgats. So we need to understand that you know a little bit of a spiritual explanation for why that would be. When the Torah was given together with the second Luchas, which was a completely different presentation to the first Luchas, Noisef Oid Inyan, something was added to the experience, which the Gemara actually discusses. In addition to the fact that Moshe is given the offcuts, he's also given content. What content? The vast analysis of Torah was given as a gift to Moshe. That is actually the deeper meaning of what we discussed earlier. Moshe carved the Luchos down here in the physical world. The boys in Shomai Lohoi were because in the first Luchos, which were in the heavenly realm, there was no, <coughs> there was no um, offcut or, or waste. What's it telling us? Torah in its pristine original form in the spiritual realms where it originates. Which is the Torah as shared and depicted in the first Luchos. Is a Torah of absolute unity. That can't be split into elements and pieces, etc. And there's for sure no concept of waste or offcuts or overflow. 
everything in the Torah in its original pristine form is in the deepest, holiest place that it could be. But when the Torah is translated into human experience, which is represented by the second Luchos, which are presented to Jews who've now done Tshuva for the worst of era ever. Which is effectively telling us that because of the power of Teshuvah, the Jews were able to earn the rights to be given the Luchos, to be given Torah in their terms, on their terms, in their reality. So then, that's a Torah that can be split into various levels and experiences. To the extent that there could be so called overflow or off cuts, in other words, parts of Torah that are more external to the story. In other words, when you read about this person's ox goring that person's cow, that's almost like the psalm. It's like the overflow of Torah. You're not seeing the real divinity of Torah in that story. You're seeing something that, reply, that applies to civil law. Now we can start to explain the connection between the psalm, the physical offcuts, and the pil- the pilpul, the deep analysis of Torah, both of which were given to Moshe. Surely, if Moshe is given the wisdom and insight to be able to delve into the pilpul of Torah, that must be a very elevated experience. Which is the exact opposite of psalm, of waste matter that you cut away from the stone as you're carving it. So how do they collate and correlate? What was introduced to the world with a second Luchos was the concept that not everything is absolutely clear and therefore you work through Torah. Kimavur Baruch HaBachasidus explains this in great detail. That now it's, it's not automatic. It doesn't just download into your brain. You have to toil through Torah in order to capture Torah. Which in itself is paradoxical. Because on the one hand, why do you have to struggle to Torah? Because things are not so clear. And because you have many questions. Yet the incredible paradox is that it's specifically when you're working through things with so much effort, that's when you actually capture the essence. It's actually through that effort of us trying to understand and asking questions and having doubts about whether we've understood correctly and having to revisit, etc. That takes us to the essence of the Torah, which is a dimension beyond, even as the Torah was in its pristine form, on a high, as Hasidus explains at length, we access a dimension of Torah, which is way beyond how the Torah was originally going to be presented to us at Matan Torah with the first Luchos. That's the gift that David gave to Moshe of the analysis of Torah. <coughs> which the Gemara sometimes calls just simply pilpul. Or they, implying that it's almost like the offcuts. Yet at the same time we say this is what gives you the true understanding and the sharpest understanding of Torah. The ultimate level of appreciation and understanding and comprehension of Torah which was given to Moshe Rabbeinu as a personal gift and Moshe with his incredibly generous attitude shared it with all of us and allowed us the opportunity to wade our way through the challenges of understanding Torah to the point that we could actually capture the essence of Torah.